Oh, yeah, yeah. So I guess maybe we'll go over this first question. How do we know each other? So yes. um, as with our first guest on this uh, math major chat thing that I'm doing, uh, I was a visitor at Colorado College for four years, and Nate was a student at Colorado College for the same four years. That sounds right. I believe so. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know each other from then. He took a bunch of classes that I taught, and... Uh, I convinced him to do a senior project with me. And then we went rock climbing a couple, a couple times together. <laughs> sort of standard stuff, really. <laughs> does this, does this check out historically on yeah, your end? Yeah. I would say the, the one story that, uh, comes to mind here was you, I mean, you still look quite young, but back then you looked younger, believe it or not. Um, and <laughs> I remember walking out from the Colorado College uh, climbing gym or the like the rec center there and oh yeah yeah I remember this and, and asking you like what block you were in or something you know at, yeah. treating you like a student you're like no no I actually teach courses <laughs> and I was like oh <laughs> whoops yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was not super young then either no 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 I just I uh, misread um, yeah you were you were like oh man people like uh, who are seniors look a lot older than me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like something. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what you were thinking. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think you were in a class. Were you in a class of mine the first year? I don't remember. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, what cal happened is calculus two and you were way over prepared. <laughs> yeah, that's true because, which is fine. I mean, everyone needs sort of a, a gimme every once yeah. in a while. Yeah. Well, what happened was I was taking a liberal arts course, um, for the beginning of that block. And then I was just getting my butt kicked. And I was like, you know, I really just want to study math. And I knew you were teaching this course. So I was like, oh, I'll switch in and you let me switch in. And I had to catch up the first few days, which isn't very much at a standard university, but at Colorado college, it's a bit. So I, I had one or two late nights and then I, I caught up. Right. And, and then you, it. you were good to go, right? Yep. Yep. Nice. Um, so did you know that you wanted to be a math major like immediately mm. or did you, did you like play around with other majors? I remember you sort of being around the department from a fairly early spot in your time there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, was just right off the bat psyched to be a math major. And the reason was as an, as a high schooler, I was looking at universities to do engineering um, and ended up finding out that Colorado College was a, the best fit for me as a university, regardless of the major. Um, I just was on campus and I was like, this is a good place. So I went to, decided to go to CC um, and math was the closest thing to engineering. I mean, I could have done physics, but in fact, I kind of got my butt kicked in AP <laughs> physics. And so I was like, I probably can't, can't hang with these people. I'll try mathematics. Um, and did you take any physics classes at CC? No, no, I didn't take any. I just took math classes. I think you probably would have been okay. And the general requirements probably. Yeah. I mean, I think the AP physics C that I took in high school was hard. Um, yeah. with, uh, is, I think it's Dr. Michael Fuchs. I think it was Michael Fuchs. Dr. Fuchs was his name. And, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I got, it was a hard class. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that stuff's supposed to be hard, right? Yeah. Totally. You know, like uh this is one thing that I learned when I was in grad school is like sometimes a class can kick your butt, but it's you you'd still did okay. Yeah. Right? And you shouldn't like that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pursue that thing. Mm -hmm. Um but I mean that being said, you took some computer science classes as well, right? That's right. Yeah, I I almost uh did a minor in computer science. That was well. I thought about doing that, but I didn't quite get far enough along to uh, right. get a minor. Yeah. I mean, at some point, like whether or not it's a minor or just a bunch of classes sort of doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. I've definitely yeah. noticed to be noticed it to be helpful in graduate school, um, especially as an applied mathematics yeah. person. Like I definitely have a leg up on people that haven't taken those classes. So it's worthwhile for those of you looking into graduate school and specifically applied mathematics, like definitely I would suggest 
taking some computer science courses. Yeah, under. this is this is a good point, and it echoes something that Olivia said. So Olivia, you know, is also studying applied mathematics um, at UNC, yeah, and she took a little bit of computer science, but not very much at all, maybe one course while she was at CC. And she felt that that was a deficit mm -hmm. when she entered grad school. The fact that she had just taken one course? That she had just taken one course. Yep. And so uh, I'm really glad that you kind of echoed the the usefulness of taking computer science. I think it's helpful for a, a pure mathematician as well. Yep. You know, I think like writing code is like writing a good proof. Yep. Um, and also, I think there's a lot of future in pure mathematics by experimentation via code and stuff as well. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so, you can't get, can't get a feel of what's going on in a problem until you do a ton of examples. What's a better way to do yeah. a ton of examples than have a smart way to code it up? And you don't have to, you know, spend <laughs> years with a pen and paper trying right. to get out some heinous example. Right. Yeah, especially now that math is so hard. <laughs> um, I mean, working out examples is like completely uh, impossible by hand nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody did ask if I coded in uh, what languages I code in, uh, what software do I prefer to perform analysis of big data? And I've just been doing Python. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Python. That echoes what Olivia said as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like straight Python. I mean, I guess there are packages that do mm -hmm. that'll allow more mathematical stuff in there, right? Yeah. So for a list of packages that we've been using recently, um, so I've done a couple internships at the Pacific Northwest National Labs um, doing data science sort of stuff. And out there we used um, a lot of PyTorch. Um, so... If you're doing machine learning, PyTorch is a really good library. Um, recently, we've been developing our own package for biological data analysis. Um, not we, the royal we, not even really we, but postdocs I've been working with. Um, sure. And that kind of stuff works on this idea from this package called SK Learn, where you have modules with a, um, where you create, uh, I guess, classes that have fit in transform functions within them. Um, and it's kind of a general framework to do your analyses and machine learning procedures. Um, and then we also use this package called ML flow, which um, is kind of a way to um, keep track of parameters and experiments, um, just like keep things really organized. Because the one of the big hurdles I've found with machine learning in general is just trying to keep track of all the stinking parameters that you're working with and all the different like ways you can run one experiment. You know, you're, you're training some model, you know, there you can change the learning rate. You can change all these other different parameters. Um, and you know, what's the best combination of parameters on your training data or your validation data? Like it, it's hard to figure out. So it's really nice to find packages that help you organize that stuff and search the parameter space efficiently. So sure. Yeah. I don't know if that's too much in the weeds, but <laughs> no, no, I think like, you know, it's just enough in the weeds. <laughs> you know, I think like people are really interested in this kind of stuff. Um, cool. I mean, it really, I, I mean, I don't want to like get too high on, you know, this, sort of experiment that I'm doing or whatever, but I think like opening this kind of stuff up for public consumption is sort of uh, revolutionary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like having people honestly talk about, you know, their transitions between schools and what it's like, like sort of being in the trenches and stuff. I think it's a really important kind of thing to open up. And, you know, I know that I would have been a voracious, um, digester of this sort of material at a certain stage of my life. Totally. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you're studying like data science broadly. So, so yeah, well, what's, what's like the situation? So I know Olivia <laughs> yeah. told me she uh, works with an applied math group and her project um, sort of condensed down to modeling, I think via like, differential equations type stuff, uh, uh, wildfires. 
Mm -hmm. But I don't know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. So if it's if it's possible to know. Yeah, I can try to do the elevator speech. Um, Sure. So there's kind of two to three main projects. Um, The first of which is like and I'm just talking for my dissertation, not other things that I've ticked off along the way or like I'm not going to get into details about what I did for my master's or internship work. Um, Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But just dissertation roadmap um, from last time I spoke with my advisor is the first project is this really what I find is really cool project um, that involves an efficient way to calculate medians of subspaces, which is kind of weird. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, and applying this method to um, data sets of videos and images and kind okay. of reiterating how a median is uh, more robust than a mean in terms of uh, robustness to outliers. But in this oh, weird sure. space of subspaces, you know, we have to answer questions of like, oh, how do we take an image or a video and translate this to a subspace and all these sort of things. But if you're if you're interested, please read my paper and cite it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bet you guys get more citations than I do. <laughs> Uh, I, I, because no, no one's citing vertex operator algebra papers. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, okay. So when you say the word subspace, yeah, is that like a like properly you're viewing the data set as a vector space, and this is a vector subspace of that data set, or is this like a subset of the data? Mm, yeah, I wish I had something to draw on. Um, oh, yeah, I mean that you're using. That's on you for not having that. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So, so I mean, uh, we could we could save it for. I mean, you could like have something uh, like some nice up. graphics for the talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. I'll I'll do the best I can. And and if you, yeah. you can't, do hands uh, and stuff, <laughs> exactly. And if you can't, um, if you don't feel like you fully understand it, uh, feel free to to message me, and I'll try to try to clarify it. But. And this is in no way like some sort of crazy cutting edge thing that's going to solve the world's problems, but it's like mildly interesting. So, sure. Um, so, essentially, what you can do is take an image, um, and that let's say color image with three color bands. You can so um, you can take each one of the color bands and vec it. So that means just stacking in an organized way, um, like the red band. The red band is one image right with different red color um intensities and you can stack this into a vector and then you can have the green band stack that into oh so you're like taking an array of data and turning it into a column vector yeah you're well in this case you're gonna have uh so let's say you have uh five you have a very low low uh let's say you have 500 pixels in an image which is a very small number Uh then you would have 500 pixels in a red green blue image then you would have a matrix in R five hundred by three, yeah. right? And Got Got so it. now this is a matrix, um, and you can think about the span of its columns mm-hmm. as a three dimensional subspace of five hundred dimensional space. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I'm when I'm talking about a subspace that would be uh, a three dimensional subspace of five hundred dimensional space, and then you Got can. It. You can do that um, with images or videos in a similar way where, you know, you can, you just have a wider, a wider matrix or a higher dimensional subspace of 500 dimensional space. If you're talking about like a short video clip. Um, Right. And then, and then you, you use, uh, you can, you can represent this subspace using a matrix with orthonormal columns and kind of do your your game play your game in that uh i don't want to say space but in that uh yeah world right and so so what do you get out of it so like what is it like if i gave you an image like me yeah yeah um and you found the median of that image Mm -hmm. of me what does that tell you I would want a set of images of you. So let's say we had a set of images of you with different illuminations. So you have a light bulb okay. here, light bulb here, light bulb here, light bulb here. Okay. And 
Um, now you take those set of images. One thing you could do is just vec each one of those images and calculate the mean, not doing any sort of subspace thing. And then got it. And then unvec that image and look at an image of your face, and it would be all sorts, probably be all sorts of distorted because the lighting is different, right? Sure. And the mean wouldn't actually look like your face. But if you use um, subspaces here, so for each of those different illuminated pictures, you have a subspace, and now you calculate the mean of those subspaces, you're going to get a better sort of picture of your face that's like maybe fully illuminated and, and looks like you. Um, and, you know, perhaps if you do a median, maybe it'll look even slightly better. Maybe that's not the best example because you don't really have any outliers. Um, right. But let's say you contaminated that data set with some images of just a cow in a field, you know, um, yeah. the, the mean would look a bit messed up, but the median would look still kind of like you. Right. Cause it's resistant to the cow. <laughs> cow resistant. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> yeah. So, so I really nice. just, so half of my dissertation is, is cow resistant faces. <laughs> There, there's a paper with the with the illumination um, subspace things, um, but I, I don't remember it off the top of my head. So, so is this something that like Google looks at to develop like computational photography algorithms, or is that not related? <laughs> God, I wish. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I think this is more just our brainchild. Um, I think it's mathematically interesting too because it kind of ended yeah. up combining. Um, some work, uh, by this sort of some ideas about the geometric median in RN with this flag median idea that my advisor, Dr. Kirby came up with, um, along with some other people okay. a few years ago. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. not only is it like moderately interesting in application, it's interesting in theory, but yeah. Right. So, I mean... I guess we've been talking about it with images, but this is something you could do with like a, any data set. Yeah. As long as you can represent it, represent a point in the data set as a subspace. R right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which you, yeah, you, yeah. you could do probably, but on any mm -hmm. data set might be a lot, but um, for, for lots of data sets at least. Mm -hmm, totally. And so yeah. that's, so that's one project. Um, and then the second project is kind of a general thing that we've been doing with our group, which is more, um, uh, analysis with, um, biological data sets specifically with, um, how do you say it? with, uh, gene expression data sets and detecting, uh, whether or not, um, certain subjects, different types of animals are uh, maybe shedding a specific virus. Um, so a data set that we work with often oh. is this uh, data set with humans um, that uh, some of which are infected with the influenza virus. And in the data set, there's different um, times <clears throat> and uh, each human, there's a blood sample from a human at a different time. And uh, you also have information whether or not the humans are infected or and whether or not they're actually shedding the virus. Um, mm -hmm. And using this data set, you can come up with different classification tasks. And then we have model sort of novel um, machine learning algorithms that work well with these data sets. Um, and so we're working on some papers there. In addition, like kind of trying to think about how genes interact with each other and trying to understand there's like been this new field that people are new in quotes field that people are really excited about called graph convolutional networks. And we've been thinking about that too. Um, okay. So I don't need to yeah. get into super detail about that, but that's cool. Cause it's relevant with like the COVID um, pandemic and all that. Um, right. So right. It's almost like whoever's the boss over there is like really good at choosing <laughs> things to get paid. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. I don't mean that in a negative way, right? I mean, you yeah, have yeah. to, uh, I mean, do things that you're interested in, right? But if you can also swing that into something that's relevant, that's sweet. Yeah, totally. And it's been actually really cool. So we were doing the analyses with this. Um, the data set is on uh, the gene expression Omnibus, GEO, and it's the GSE73072 data set. Um, and if anybody ever wants cool. to, 
Um, so, uh, and we were working with this data set, this influenza data set a long time ago, um, not a long time ago, but you know, way before the pandemic ever started. So it was almost just serendipity that, um, you know, this, uh, right, COVID happened. Is that what you're saying? Happened and then, and then all of a sudden this stuff seems way more relevant and important than it did. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, well, you're distinguishing people that have the flu and people that don't. It's like, who cares? It's a respiratory infection. And then like COVID steps in and right. it's like, oh, all of a sudden I'm saving the world. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, this is what happened. Like all the RNA vaccine, um, you know, startups or whatever. Yeah. They've been working on RNA vaccines for decades, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not like all of that stuff was just developed all of a sudden. The technology was developed over a long time. They just like happened to, it happened to have the application uh, land in them in this moment, right? Yeah. So it's I mean, wild. it's kind of similar to that, right? You know, just like yeah. you guys were kind of doing the right thing at the right time. Totally. Totally. I mean, and just yeah. like... I started YouTube at the right time. <laughs> that's that's true. It's very yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this yeah, is like, start. this is like how all success is made. You get lucky. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Un unfortunately, I guess. Yeah. I, I mean, mean un <laughs> more or less. <laughs> yeah, for the... Yeah. Yeah. What, you, you know what I mean? I mean, that's a big, that's a big thing to talk about. <laughs> of course. Yeah. We're not trying to be yeah. controversial. <laughs> right. Um, so you went straight into grad school right after college, right? That's correct. Did you think about taking a gap year doing anything in between? I did. Or, yeah. Or... And then I remember, I think okay. I spoke with you and I spoke with some other people I don't remember what your sentiment was. I was probably was, like, yeah, go live in a van. Come on now. <laughs> oh, no, no. It was, then it was definitely from speaking to other people. Because I, so I only applied <laughs> to one grad school after undergrad. Um, yeah. And it was Colorado State. And I didn't expect to, to be accepted. And then all of a sudden, I was accepted to their PhD program. And I was like, well, I guess I'm doing this. Um, yeah. My original plan was to take a year off and uh, do some rock climbing or whatever. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm sort of glad I just went directly into it because I have, I didn't really lose much, you know, during that one summer that I had off, um, I was right. able to step back in and I was still fresh and, you yeah. know, it made those first couple of years that are already really stressful in terms of passing exams and all that, um, right. it made them a little bit more relaxed. And I know Colorado state doesn't have quite as rigorous of a qualifier exam and, and sort of set up as a lot of schools do. Um, but, but it's still it's, a lot. It's still stressful. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was that. So what was that transition like? Mm. So did you get there and the classes were immediately, I remember when I went to grad school, I landed there and I didn't go to a small liberal arts college, but I went to a small state school. Mm -hmm. that didn't send a lot of people to grad school and didn't have a graduate program. Mm -hmm. And a, a bunch of the people in my classes had already taken these graduate classes as undergraduates and just seemed oh. like super prepared compared to me. Did you experience anything like that? No. I mean, to be honest, I felt um, pretty middle of the pack or slightly ahead because there were a good number of people that were coming off of time from not being in school or people that had okay. taken time off or had been working jobs. So they had to come back. And there were some people that I remember that had come from tech jobs or whatever, and were going to get their math PhD or masters and just totally crushed it. Like right off the bat, just cause they were adults, you know, like really yeah. good work ethic, like super incredible organization, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, the stuff that really counts, you know, like, Sure, you can be smart or whatever, but if that that only gets you so far, <laughs> in my opinion. Right. Um, yeah. And those people did pretty well, but there were also people that you know had all those the organization, everything, but just were so far removed from mathematics that it seemed really difficult for them. For me mm -hmm. personally, going into graduate school, I felt like pretty. I felt prepared enough. Um, and I felt like the bar was set just high enough that I had to work hard, but I 
was able to hang on and, and I didn't have to sacrifice like my quality of life for my hobbies. So yeah, yeah. You went, you still went climbing. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so taking mostly pure math classes at a liberal arts college, it was not, it was okay as a totally. preparation. I yeah. mean, since I had taken those computer science courses, I was set. Yeah, maybe like propped up by the fact that you took some computer science. Yeah, I think like, yeah. Um, I feel like I heard this from somebody else, but the transition is a lot easier from pure mathematics into applied mathematics than the other way around. Yeah, I, I would accept that to be truth. Although I don't think I'm in the, position to really make that sort of comment <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah totally. i went from pure mathematics to pure mathematics um <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah i mean this is something that i've sort of speculated at right that uh knowledge of pure mathematics is really very helpful for the study of applied mathematics yeah especially for like developing um new algorithms or being creative um you know, mm -hmm. you just have such a larger, um, like, especially I, I worked with somebody this summer who's really, I think he's really awesome. Um, uh, why am I forgetting? Uh, Nico, I'm not remembering his last name for some reason. Um, Nico Quartz, Nicholas Quartz, um, shout out. He's, he's awesome. He's really, um, uh, really good at what he does. And, and I think the reason he's so good is he's had all this experience in pure mathematics in like, mm -hmm. I think his dissertation might be mostly pure stuff, but he was doing applied research at PNNL and would come up with new algorithms and creative solutions. And, you know, part of it is just who he is as a person. But I think the other part of it is like having a really solid pure mathematics background allowed him to, allowed him to like think creatively and uh, get like really understand these applied techniques quite quickly sure and not just understand how to press a button and go but also understand what's working on like under the surface right so so what were your first two years of courses like at colorado state um generally uh generally general requirements so i took like you know analysis algebra etc etc cetera, um oh, and, okay like so, okay. So I guess maybe in the end, will you have a PhD in math or will you have a PhD in pure in applied math? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's going to be a PhD in applied mathematics. And I think that's, I, okay. I got a master's after. So there's like a different name for it is, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, there might be. But the one thing I would state though, is that Colorado State, we're, we're really lucky to have two departments that or one department of mathematics. Mm -hmm. I, I could be wrong that it's going to say applied math or pure math or math. Like I don't, I should know this, <laughs> yeah. but, but, um, the cool thing is I think in some universities there's the applied mathematics people and they're the mathematics people and they don't really mix together, but at Colorado right, state, right. There are different we, departments. We like, we hang out together and that's good work collaboratively, you know, and that's good. they're, there are algebraic geometers and frame theorists that are part of the data science institute, you know, or <laughs> Oh, that's dope. Yeah. You know, so like they're they're and I think that's really important. I think that's what informs like new creative research and, and new algorithms yeah, and you, new new things. You know, you can't just like <clears throat> Yeah. yeah just, you want a diversity of thought in all the different ways. Totally. Yeah. Yep. Well said. Um, so you took like, I mean, real analysis is pretty standard for mm -hmm. uh, applied math because it's like, you know, analysis is um, one of the bedrocks, but you took like algebra and did you take topology and stuff like that? Yeah. You know, I actually didn't, I didn't take a topology class, which is funny because okay. I do yeah, yeah. like some of this topology stuff. Um, not particularly. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're on the, it sounds like. You're sort of on the edge of this topological data analysis. Yeah, totally. Um, Henry Maybe Adams not at in CSU it, but on the edge of it, yeah. Yeah, Henry Adams at CSU is really good at this stuff and does a lot of work with that. Um, I'm, 
uh, not fully in it, but yeah, definitely. Yeah. Walking around the edge. Um, let's see what, I, I mean, regardless of the courses, we had to take qualifier exams and that was kind of the first yeah. two semesters ideally. And for us, it was just the mm-hmm. finals. So at Colorado state, you just take, Oh a, wow. That's very nice. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so there are just certain courses where the final is the qualifier exam as well. And if you do well enough, you get a check next to your name. Yeah. And you have to pass a certain number of these in certain yeah. suites. So, um, sure. you know, uh, the algebra analysis, I'm forgetting yeah. the names of the suites right now, but, um, right. And I had to take four. Yeah. And they were not finals and they were, each of them were over a full year of material. Yeah. So like I took algebra analysis, complex analysis and topology. Yeah. And I think, I think that's not uncommon. Like I'm pretty sure CU works similarly. Um, I think like my, my, my institution is now doing three. mm -hmm. I think four is kind of a lot, but I think three is fairly sort of standard. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wonder how standard CSU's workflow is, but whatever. I mean, I, I think it was sufficient. Um, you know, pretty much the idea is like, can you, can you jump over this first, like difficult bar to jump over, you know, and you have a good enough of a basis in mathematics and then now start doing your research. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so after that, what's your next hurdle? Is it your, um, sort of thesis proposal or oral examination or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is an interesting, so at Colorado state, we have the preliminary exam, which is yeah, like effectively an oral examination where you just kind of outline what you've done toward your dissertation and what, um, you're going to do. And this has to be done at most, or sorry, at least a year before you defend. Um, Okay. So we're ballparking sometime this summer, a year meaning two semesters. Um, so if sure, I like an academic spring, year, yeah, academic year. So I can do my prelim in the summer and defend in the spring. Um, okay. So that, yeah. So that's the that's the plan. Um, so that's why it's becoming crunch time this summer. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But no, that's good. good. So, that. is it mostly a presentation or mostly an oral exam? <laughs> that's a good question. Or do you know? <laughs> uh, I should know. Um, yeah, mine. Mine was mostly a presentation. Yeah, I think. I think the idea is it's like an hour long presentation, and then okay. you know, whatever thirty minutes or an hour of questions. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the presentation, you know, is that, and then it's just that. And then you kind of can think about the examination as being like, well, these questions of like, right. what about filling in that hole? Like, or like, do you think you just said you're going to do something that's like really, really hard? Are you sure you're going to be able to do that? Or like, um, yeah, it's standard sorts of questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. That's cool. Yep. Um, yeah, that sounds like fairly similar to what, you know, I went through or what kind of most people go through. Um, so what's your plan after grad school? Uh, yeah. Um, I know that's like sort of a mean question. I recognize that. <laughs> no, it's cool. Um, let's see after school. Um, I would I mean, be really ex- lots of different opportunities because of the, what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would be really excited to do some kind of con- continuing to work with this infectious disease stuff. Um, okay. And for me, like the ideal job would be, <laughs> this is, this is a lot to ask too, though. Right. It's like, I'd like something like that is, I kind of have, rather than being specifically like who I'm going to work for or specifically yeah. what project I want to work on, there are like stipulations yeah. being like, I would like something that's maybe, you know, not quite 40 hours a week, like 30 hours a week working in industry, you know, and, and where it's okay. mainly remote sort of thing. Um, okay. So you and, don't want academia? 
No, I don't think I'm going to be in academia. Um, I've definitely entertained the idea of even though teaching. data science, like you could actually do that. That's true. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I, I'm interested. I could be interested at in teaching at like a community college, something like that. Um, you know, because uh, I, I do have experience like teaching calc and stuff through yeah. through the stuff I've been doing at school here. Um, yeah, but I feel like it might allow me more flexibility to do some sort of industry job. Um, maybe not national lab, but just um, industry, sort of a more of a remote position where it's not quite full time. Um, I think that seems. Hopefully, I can get. I it. mean, I don't know. That seems doable to me. I mean, yeah. I don't know anything about that stuff, but it seems like, <laughs> you know, everyone wants to hire data scientists, right? Yeah. Um, and the world is going towards things being more flexible and also the recognition that um, a work week doesn't have to be 40 hours and it's more about like what you get done and not how much you work. Yeah. Um, or at least yeah. hopefully it's going towards that direction. Um, so anyway, yeah, this seems like a very doable thing yeah but that's that's pretty much where where i'm headed <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that seems good um okay so d is there anything else you'd like to add in before we do some of these viewer suggested questions yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i have like two things so on um or i guess one thing so i did get my master's on my way to my phd and that's something that a lot of people no big deal. Uh, do, or some people do. And part of yeah. it is as like a safety net, right? Right. So it's like maybe, you know, you get half your a quarter of your PhD done and you go run your master's project, um, produce that. And then, you know, you're another year in and you're like, this PhD thing's really too much for me. I can quote master out and bail and just get my master's mm -hmm. and just have my master's in hand. Like you have some sort of diploma for, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the three, four years you spent in school. Um, so I did that. And it's and, not a and, ton of extra work, right? No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't like, be. If, if the you're working towards your PhD, it should be just a little bit extra, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what I did and kind of what I've communicated to my advisors that my, I ended up doing my master's and I was so sick of that project by the time I finished. And it was with this infectious disease stuff. Um, that I was just like, I don't even want to look at this again. And that's where I got into the whole subspace thing. Yeah. Um, and I learned yeah. all about this field and, and tried to make a contribution to all this stuff. Um, but now I'm back into the infectious disease stuff and doing the subspace stuff. So now I have kind of like a multifaceted uh, yeah. dissertation that I'm working toward. But like, um, yeah, I guess that's something to be aware of though, is like, it's a common thing for people to do in graduate school. Um, as a mm -hmm. safety net. And the other thing you can do is if you get accepted, if you have your favorite school and you get accepted for a master's program, but not the PhD, you could do the master's and then apply to the PhD program as you're getting your master's. Um, oh, and yeah. If, and if, if you're like program, in good standing, you have a fairly good shot. Exactly. So I think that's like a worthwhile note. It's a little tricky because you're generally not funded for master's, but. Yeah. So, yeah, let's just do some of these questions. So which were, which classes were most difficult for you? Like maybe in grad school and in college as well. Um, which class were difficult? Oof. Okay. Oh man, that's a hard one. Uh, Cause Nate's I mean, so smart. Of, nothing's hard for him. I think it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I'm going to say like, so I did the Budapest semester in mathematics and I think that was yeah. probably the hardest the hardest thing for me, um, just that yeah. entire semester. Um, I took not, it's like a cheat code semester. for when you get back though. Right. Oh yeah. No, it was awesome. I mean, I think, yeah. I think I like completely leveled up like in general mathematics knowledge and mm -hmm. in my ability to learn mathematics mm -hmm. and grasp abstract topics. And it's also like a preview for grad school. So I would certainly suggest applying if you're interested in learning about this kind of stuff. Um, because it's just like a full semester in Budapest, only taking math courses. I took a Hungarian course. That was my non-math course. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and it's math courses that generally are not offered widely. Yep. Yeah. 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 yeah highly suggested um, mm -hmm. from my end too. I've sent a bunch of people to that. 
BSM, um, Budapest yep. Semesters in Mathematics. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's one from the, the comment page that I sent you. I don't know if this is too technical. What kind of things do you consider when choosing between dim dimensionality reduction method like PCA and one-shot learning? <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. Uh, if there's like no answer to that, we don't, we, could, <laughs> we could like delete the whole thing though. No, no, it's okay. Um, okay. So I think... Uh, so I think there's some things to consider with the dimensionality reduction methods like PCA. There's also common, so PCA stands for principal component analysis. There's also um, multidimensional scaling, which is abbreviated as MDS. And then there's UMAP. And I don't, for the life of me, can't remember what that stands for. Uniform, I don't know, I'm not even going to try. Um, and so each of these dimensionality reduction methods um, are kind of unique in their own way. I believe there's a tie between PCA and MDS. I won't get into the details, um, but UMAP is kind of its own thing. There's also TSNE. Um, and I think PCA is generally the most, one of the more simple dimensionality reduction methods. And that's something I would try first. But if you don't see separation between your classes using a simple dimensionality reduction, like mm -hmm. PCA or MDS, I would start looking into things like TSNE or UMAP which are slightly more complicated, but they do things like, oh, what is it? Like <clears throat> um, trying to force clusters of data to be closer together. Things that are kind of close together are way close together using MDS okay. or using UMAP. And things that are kind of far apart are way far apart using UMAP. And if you're actually, <laughs> Michael, if you're interested, there's like um, the UMAP paper is like um, actually like a pretty quote deep, uh, pure mathematics paper that resulted oh. in this interesting applied uh, technique. And one of the postdocs that I worked with uh, that I've been working with did a lot of his um, uh, PhD work looking at the UMAP paper. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, like these, I'd probably just stick with more simple methods rather than complex ones to start. And then if you don't see solution, because they're easier to explain. And then if you want to go to something more complex, you can. Um, and then using one shot learning for dimensionality reduction, I'm actually not as I'm not familiar with that being used, but I'm imagining it's a supervised technique. So I'd also, yeah, consider, um, when you're doing dimensionality reduction, um, definitely distinguish whether or not you're using a supervised technique or unsupervised technique. Um, and if you're using something that's supervised, um, yeah, make sure that you state it. Uh, yeah, hopefully that sort of answers the first question. Yeah. So uniform manifold approximation and projection. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. It looks it looks really interesting. Yeah, it's a long paper um, too. It's not an easy one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, is what you do statistical in nature or about theoretical modeling? Like um, how how close is data science to something that's statistical? Very close. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also close to um, theoretical modeling too. I think like it's a bit of an ambiguous field, you know, when, when we're all right. saying done, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> like maybe I mean, everything's connected, been, right? So statisticians have been doing data science forever. Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I like I want to also clarify that I'm not the expert on all things data science and I'm not the sure. one that coined the definition and that there are actually some funny like articles and papers about defining what data science actually is and stuff. Yeah. So um, those are worthwhile to look at <laughs> if yeah. you really want a better explanation. So. Uh, what sub disciplines of math are most useful for dealing with this kind of stuff? Analysis, algebra, statistics, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Coding. <laughs> big big data. Yeah. I, uh, I think in terms of like working with a huge data set, like yeah, computer science, <laughs> like okay. hands down, yeah. um, understanding how to, um. Yeah, work with that. And then having um, the resources to work with a huge data set, right? Like, um, 
whether that's you doing some sort of cloud computing and paying for um, using uh, like just having computing. the power. Yeah, like you need the power too. Like you have to right. understand how to allocate things correctly. Then you also need the power. And I think somewhere along the lines on a resume or somewhere on my website, maybe I said that I, I work with big data. Maybe that's a bit of a misnomer. Like I work with data. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Big data, again, is kind of like a fun buzzword. But oh, right. Yeah. Big I'm data sure it's is not really, well really, really big. Data is, big data is really, really, really big. I work with like maybe average size. <laughs> <laughs> right, don't yeah. have to take this stuff into account quite as much. But I think if you're average with, size data, <laughs> if you're working with really big data, uh, computer science for sure. Yeah, really big data would be like Facebook user data or something, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. and I think evil. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So the and then they were saying sub discipline of advanced mathematics. Um, probably, I mean, I'm almost guessing at this point, but I would guess that like, yeah, understanding statistics and I don't know, like somebody might get annoyed if I say that statistics is part of advanced mathematics, statistics might be its own thing. Nah, I think it's fine. Whatever. Um, I mean, I think that you had a pretty strong background in all of that stuff though, right? Yeah. Enough of one for sure. Yeah. So it might be kind of tricky to parse out just because you were comfortable with a lot of that. Oh, you mean like moving? Yeah. If you're moving into grad school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I would say in terms of like just working with big data in general, like just, yeah, like statistics and understanding how to use um, like yeah. computer science. Like if you know those two things, you can do simple things and you can scale them to really big data sets which are like if you're working with big data that's kind of what you what you want to do you're not going to try to do something super crazy and complicated um, sure. with a huge data set like the stuff you do wouldn't work on a big data set is that what you're getting <laughs> at i mean not wouldn't work like uh you're useless <laughs> no no but, but what it's it's not the a huge data set is not the application for what you're working on yeah i think the subspace methods um can apply on larger data sets um but i think if we were to google the definition of how big a big data set actually is like um perhaps that method wouldn't be the best um but i think is like it because general, it's like uh computationally expensive yeah yeah few iterations to run but it's relatively computationally expensive i think um but I think uh, if you're doing just like vanilla machine learning algorithms on large data sets, um, I mean, your knowledge of mathematics probably isn't as important as your knowledge of how to um, do things in the computer science realm. Yeah. Yeah. Like get the machine to do it efficiently. Yep. And store the data intelligently. And yeah, yeah. all that stuff. Um, do you have a favorite book? Okay, so the, it it says, "What is your favorite book on high dimensional geometry and its application to big data?" Oh. And what are your favorite book resources in general? Oof. Okay, that's actually really hard. Um, <laughs> but I think I I think I have the right answer for this. There is a right answer. Um, so my advisor well, is working on a of book. Of course, there is because it's your opinion. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But there's also a right answer. <laughs> okay. So my advisor is working on a book. I'm not sure if it's published. Oh, yet. Um, yeah, there's a right answer. But yeah, exactly. Right. So look for, look for a book coming out um, by Michael Kirby. Um, another Michael. Uh, yeah. Weird. But yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to remember what it's called uh, off the bat. I don't think I, um, I'm not sure if I remember it off the bat, but I can I can send it to you, Michael, once we're done chatting and get um, <clears throat> get that to you. I don't think I have it in my downloads. I had downloaded it at one point, like one of the manuscripts, but I don't think I have. Yeah, I'd be psyched. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Yeah. But I think it's a good resource, and it and it does like. I think I can legitimately recommend it because it's generally the way that i've learned about a lot of this stuff and it is going to take a really nice geometrical approach 
have right. some you have some proofs in it, but also like have applications to real world data sets and some good intuition and understanding of how this stuff works. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, I'm writing a textbook. Oh, really? On vertex yeah, about, operator algebras? Yeah, dude. It's going to be like the first real textbook on vertex operator algebras. There's going to be exercises and stuff. Oh, nice. Not just like a manuscript. That's awesome. Or a, or a monograph. Yeah. yeah. Are there like, gonna... there are survey papers though, right? And stuff like that. Yeah. And there are, there are books too, but the books don't have, they're not for like really learning. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're like, he, this is just an aggregate of all the information. It, yeah, exactly. Rather than like, here's some stuff, here's some practice problems. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. Like, dude, yeah, I'm really into doing problems. Totally. Um, I found no. I found the book, a oh, comprehensive introduction to mathematical modeling. Is that it? Um, let me see. On, I'm on his website. Yeah, that's probably it. M. Uh, Kirby no, no. This and is be, this one's called G linear, linear algebra for data science. Okay, is going to be what it's called. Um, okay, because a lot of this stuff that we do is just, uh, kind of a simple linear algebra. Um. Jeez, dude, he has 106 papers. Yeah, he he, Jesus. he advises a lot of people. <laughs> since like uh, 1987, since 1987, okay. That makes more sense, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, and it's applied math, so it's easy, so. <laughs> oh, my, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get out of bullhorn. Just kidding, yeah. everyone. <laughs> No, yeah, it's all right. It's different. I would say it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Like are, um, are authors alphabetized in applied math? No. No. It's by contribution. Uh, y kind of. So I... You guys got to get... A, yeah. In math, in pure math, it's alphabetizing because like we're all equal because it's like a... Uh, a commune it's anarchism it's like beautiful <laughs> anarcho-communism in pure math uh, i don't know i like the i like the, uh <laughs> so i think the the general author order that i see is like first author is like the person who made the main contribution um, yeah and then the last author is generally you the like person that who advised the project um so if like there's let's say like okay. you Let's say we had gotten a paper out of uh, what I had worked on uh, with you during my last right, year. Right, like if that college. other person hadn't written the paper. Exactly. If yeah. that other person hadn't written the paper. Exactly. Then, then, um, if I, I, I guess in that scenario, you had done a lot. Um, but let's say I had done, I had actually sat down on my own and solved our problem, um, and um, and then we had gone. I had written it up. And then we had gone to publish. My name would have been first and your name would have been second because I was the person that sat down and did the legwork at the end of the day. And then you okay. were the person that was like, here's the problem. Here's the field. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is, this is where we're working. Do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's a little bit harder with the undergrad project. Cause I feel like you definitely have to hold my hand a lot more. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it a couple more times since then. And mm -hmm. It's a lot of like, do this step next. Yeah. yeah. Now do this step. <laughs> and that's, I guess that's something to be noted, like in grad school too, right? Like, um, as just, as you become an adult, there's less and less handholding. Um, yeah. I mean, it's different in undergrad, right? You have a year. Yeah. Like maybe true. a year and a half. You have the last year and a half where you can actually do something. Mm -hmm. And that's not very long. No. And then maybe the the big point is to to have done enough to go and like travel to conferences and get to experience that kind of off the back of all of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? It's it's obviously a different purpose or whatever. Anyway, so I, I like I like how math does it where everyone's equal. I guess <laughs> I mean you seem to be a sort of a capitalist over there, which. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I won't. Yeah, I, I won't am. hold. I won't <laughs> hold that against you too much. But <laughs> yeah, it's it, uh, yeah, that's just how it works. 
Yeah. I mean, you probably got a bunch of like Bitcoin and uh, <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Not yet. I didn't get into Bitcoin. Otherwise, I'd be in a bigger room right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Are any of these other questions on this uh, on this uh, YouTube comment page look good? I'll just start scooping the easy ones. I'm going from the bottom to the top. Okay. Um, what is typical life after we major in math? So I'm in graduate school. So typ- typical life looks very similar to what it looked like um, before I uh, right. started study before i started graduate school um yeah. in undergrad uh yeah but I just my life that. has not changed uh, since then either it's the same <laughs> yeah so um there's that possibility if you're interested <laughs> exactly yeah uh and then what's what's your favorite way to spend your free time rock climbing check me out on instagram at stoked nate Ooh, rainbows <laughs> yeah yeah okay so i will say this not every mathematician is a rock climber also, I know people that don't rock climb. Um, it just happens that Nate and I met in a place where there are a lot of climbers. So this is not, um, our intersection is not quite as uh, uh, unlikely as it might seem. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. I already said what software I prefer. Uh, to perform analysis on big data, uh, Python. I know C++ is faster though, um, or C. Oh, is uh, it? I just don't code in that. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I was at a meeting yesterday and Dr. Kirby was talking with one of the graduate students I work with and was um, reminding him that he had to write his code in C at some point to make things faster. So I guess oh, maybe... I know, more... you know, remember Rodney James? Yep. He did numerical linear algebra a little bit. Yeah. And he w- wrote numerical linear algebra algorithms in C++. Mm. Whoa. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah. I, anyway, I do know that about C++ um, is actually at least useful for that. But I think Python is just like very ubiquitous with data, right? Yeah, totally. It's definitely yeah. ubiquitous. And I think with most people that I know, just like that work in industry and stuff, Python's kind of the, the name of the game. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm, I'm just like going through these really yeah, fast. Yeah, no, you're good. So what's the most beautiful theorem in geometry? Is there ever a good place to stop? So the first question, what's the most beautiful theorem in geometry? Uh, again, Dr. Kirby would, would be happy if I said this. The, <laughs> the singular value decomposition so okay sure <laughs> it's better <laughs> i don't know if you'd call it a theorem in geometry but there is there's a lot of geometry lurking behind the theorem yeah, yeah. i um, think it's not it's not like a nice pure mathematics like theorem in geometry the way we normally think about it like but, in algebraic geometry where it like doesn't make any sense but it <laughs> is beautiful <laughs> or in like or in like um we're in like geometry like as as we know it, like geometry, geometry, like, <laughs> Oh, like S A S I guess. I don't know if that's the Pythagorean yeah, theorem. Yeah. 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 But I mean, there's like, yeah, there's some like simple, funny, like fun geometry problems and toys and stuff. But, um, no, I mean, mainly just talking about a really yeah. general, you know general... what I think is like one of the most beautiful theorems in geometry. Yeah. Shoot. The Stokes theorem on manifolds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm cheating right now. I'm looking at it. I got really into like differential forms. Oh, okay. Um, because I bought this book on them and then I made a bunch of videos to teach myself mm-hmm. what, what it's all about. Um, mm-hmm. It's like beautiful stuff. Like it's essentially just like a really big generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus, but then like just on an arbitrary manifold. Whoa. That's fun. Yeah. Anyway, do you, that's you do, what I would say is the most beautiful theorem in geometry. Yeah. You do Lie algebra stuff, right? Or no? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. You yep. just like, I, I went to a couple talks trying to learn about that stuff and I was like, this is hard, <laughs> but oh. it's interesting. The subspace yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff, that I'm, the subspace stuff that I'm talking about, um, there's a generalization of medians to Riemannian manifolds in general. Um, and yeah. that sort of uses like log and x 
maps to the log and exponential oh, yeah, maps yeah. to um to to generalize algorithms to for transport the to the to the Lie algebra. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. But like maybe not thinking even that abstract, but just thinking like you're you're yeah. trying to calculate a median on a Riemannian manifold. There's an algorithm to do this, and mm -hmm. part of this algorithm involves kind of going moving back and forth between those two spaces using the log and the yeah. exponents. So oh that yeah yeah no that's exactly like what how Lie algebras were sort of motivated right they wanted to understand these groups that were manifolds via the linear subspace which is the Lie algebra yep yeah yeah and that, so, that's fascinating yeah. yeah so what i was doing with subspaces is similar to that um but i do have a even a simpler algorithm that is more um in the linear land of linear algebra um uh that allows you to calculate medians um on a, a specific type of Riemannian manifold. Oh, cool. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's that. Uh, okay, so is there ever a good place to stop? Um, according to, to Michael Penn, there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I got hooked into saying this. I don't know. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> okay, what... Uh... Okay, so I think I can answer this based off of our conversation. What advice do you have for math students interested in working with big data? And that would be to take computer science. Yeah, boom. Done. Yeah. Is there anything else? Yeah. Uh, um, is it geometry... best to plot high dimensional data oh. in Euclidean or other? What was this one? Is it best to plot data in high dimension Euclidean or some other geometry? I don't know. Is there plotting? Yeah, use use PCA to reduce the dimension of your data. And then the principal component analysis, then plot the first two principal components. So it's a very standard way to visualize high dimensional data. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but that's a and you question. And you look at it in a Euclidean space. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. You do look okay. at it in a Euclidean space. But if you have high dimensional Euclidean data, you use dimensionality reduction. But then I think this question has another sort of thing. Is it best to plot high dimensional Euclidean like data or plot it in some other geometry? I think the other question there is like, um, when you do PCA or I think MDS specifically, yeah, I think it's MDS, right? Um, you don't have to necessarily use a Euclidean distance matrix for the distances between your points. Okay. You can use other oh, methods sure. to measure distances between your points. And then yeah. you can do dimensionality reduction using that data matrix for a two-dimensional embedding of your data and then plot that two-dimensional embedding of your data using a different type of distance matrix. So mm -hmm. if you'd rather um, use maybe... Uh, the angles between your data points, if they're mean centered, um, that mm -hmm. could that could maybe be a better way to uh, represent the distance between your data. I think it just depends upon um, the data set. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So, what are other like metrics? That's what you would call it, right? Yeah. So somebody somebody uh, wrote in the Kolb the KL divergence. Um, mm -hmm and i've looked at that before and i should know how that works but i'm not as familiar as i should be there's euclidean distance um i think a very common distance or not a very common distance but something that people like to use they you can calculate similarity between data points using correlation right um, mm -hmm. which is kind of an angle-based similarity measure and there's a nice fav a favorite result of mine is that well um, uh, you know, that, that correlation is, is related to the dot product and it's also related okay. to angles between vectors. And, um, so you can correlation is the correlation between two vectors is similar to the cosine of the angle between them. And so you can also calculate the distance between two vectors by looking by just calculating the angle between them if your data is mean centered. So rather than calculating this distance between the yeah, two yeah, vectors, yeah. I get it. 
you can calculate the angle. And you can also approximate that rather than using the angle, you can use the sine of the angle. Um, okay. And I, from my subspace paper, my favorite distance is the sine of the angle between the two vectors. <laughs> Um, because that's the distance that okay. we use. <laughs> um, and I'm sure they all have like uh, best use scenarios. Exactly. Yeah. I think yeah. it, yeah, I think the end of the day, like you, you kind of need to look at, um, run some experiments and see what gives you the best results um, on a, on a training data set and then apply that to a testing data set. So then we don't cheat machine learning. <laughs> Oh, right. So you don't like pick the one that gives you the results you want. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. You can pick the one that gives you the result you want on your training data set. But once right, you because it, the training data set is it's assumed that you know the answer. Yeah. Right. So you pick the one that gives you the known correct answer. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. to put it very simply. Yeah, I think. So. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've always had, I feel like I'm always running into ethical concerns with that. It's just like running experiments in any scientific field. You know, you want to make sure that what you're doing with your training data, like you you have a sequestered test set that you're testing things on, you know. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Not math. <laughs> because it's all, it's all true. You don't need to test it. You yeah, there's no ethical cool. consideration. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I think I think we're good, right? Cool. Yeah, I'm I'm good. I don't think there's This was fun, right? We covered most of these. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I uh, I hope to to see you in rifle. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs>